trick question. Yes. Oh, you guys answered it right. Come on. Let me go do it. I missed one. You missed one. <laughs> hey, that's awesome. Thanks, George. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Um, morning. How's everyone today? Good. You guys, I know you were feeling like kids. You're sore from yesterday. They went roller coaster riding and on the water park and everything. Yeah. Well, Right now, you got this bubble maker over across the way. If you really want to feel like shit, you can run across the parking lot over there. Oh, now they're hosing everybody down. So now you can go out there and get hosed down as well as covered with bubbles. And we can all feel like kids. Who's up for that? I don't see any hands. Oh, Terry's gone. Okay. Terry's gone. All right. Well, good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So it's it's great to be alive today, isn't it? Yes. Some of us are saying, well, I fell. And, yeah, I know. It's great to be. I, I sent a message over to Denise last night. And uh, when she said they went through that and they, they hit the bumps in the, in the roller coaster and kind of went airborne a little bit and came down and you know when you're when you're seasoned citizens <laughs> uh, sometimes we don't bounce as well as what we used to some of us have a lot more to bounce than others and so therefore uh, <laughs> kind of plays havoc with our bodies but you know we will recover <laughs> don't know when yeah. There we go. There you go yes. But you know, when the day comes, when that trumpet blows, we all get new bodies. So right. this is all temporary. <laughs> temporary. Use these while we can. Yeah, exactly. Um, for those of you who need coffee or anything, it's over there. Uh, Lori put out what I call the temptation tray. So there's lots of tempting things over there. I so far have stayed away from it, but it's calling my name. So good morning and welcome to Grace Street Church. If you're online with us this morning, uh, please say hi so that we know that you're with us this morning. So as we go through and as we're progressing, uh, we're over halfway through the Bible miniseries now, which is hard to believe because it just seems like we just started it. Uh, but for, for those who haven't been with us on here, uh, we do have the catch-up plan, so you can go to our website and kind of go through that. But we have the Bible Epic mini-series, which aired on the History Channel. And so we are going through that step by step and episode by episode. And then we do the sermon breakout on Sunday. And then we do the deep dive on Wednesday nights. And we get to see the videos and all that kind of fun stuff there. So that continues this Wednesday at 7 o'clock p.m. So uh, be loving to have you there. We continue on with season 19 of Orange Track Racing. So this converts into a racetrack down through the middle in here. And we have our Hot Wheels Racing, which is gonna be August 10th. Uh, so that is gonna be next Saturday morning. We'll have the racing here. Uh, soon to be kind of, I'm not sure how we're gonna do it. We haven't heard that out yet. So we got some brand new track from a company that makes the track over here in Anamosa, and it's blue. And they go by blue track racing and they make this for educational places and, and everything. So the traditional single lane Hot Wheels track is actually now two lanes that are molded together. And it's all, we're gonna have it all one continuous piece that goes all the way down. So we get rid of a lot of the bumps and all the things. And we, we, we have a lot of cars that jump the track. So, uh, but it's 19 years old. And so starting next season, uh, in the off season, we'll rebuild the track out, and it'll have blue. We'll, we got to figure out where we may paint the, the the track itself in there, not the rubber stuff, but the rest of the track may paint that orange so it can remain orange track racing. So, uh, anyway, we have that coming up next Saturday, and then our next men's breakfast. We had men's breakfast yesterday morning, and so we had uh, all kinds of neat food in there. We had corned beef hash, which we uh, decided to do this time on the grill, and that was really good. Uh, but we had casseroles. Uh, one of the other guys uh, made a casserole. He goes, I don't know if it's going to be any good. He says, I made it the first time I ever made it. So Russ brought it, and it was really good. So it was a, it was a tater tot casserole, breakfast casserole, and it was really, really good. So uh, we look forward to next month and 
um, our mystery food, plus biscuits and gravy. Yes, we had to have our biscuits and gravy. So uh, it's always a great time. And we, uh, there's sheets from the, from our devotion time that we had. And uh, we talked about who packs your parachute. And it was a true story about a guy who was uh, a fighter jet pilot in Vietnam. And he got shot down and was taken prisoner, but he survived. Well, years later, then, the gentleman who packed his parachute walked up to him in a restaurant and said, you were a fighter pilot in Vietnam, and you got shot down, and you were taken prisoner. And the guy said, how do you know all this? He goes, I was the guy that packed your parachute. And so if he hadn't done packed that parachute properly, he wouldn't be there to greet the man. And it was, it was excellent because uh, it was an excellent story of we kind of took from there of who packs your parachute, who who is there your safety net for you, and how, how do you go about doing things. So it was a really, really good session yesterday, and the sheets are on the back table if you guys want to take a peek at it. But that is... Uh, that is our announcements for this morning. We do have a movie coming up. So we had a little teaser on there, a little popcorn box. Uh, we were talking about that this morning, so we're getting ready for our September movie already, because we just had our other movie last week. Uh, but we're getting ready for our September movie that we'll have here for movie night. For you guys who don't know, we have a 12-foot screen that comes up in theater surround sound, so we uh, have a great time for the movies in here. And of course, everything's free. Uh, popcorn and brownie bites and all the fun stuff. So well, let's go ahead and go to prayer and yeah, open up this time of worship. Gracious Lord, we just praise you and thank you for being in your presence here this morning and, and for you joining us here as your word tells us that where two or more are gathered in your name, there I am amongst you and we just praise you and thank you for that today, Lord. We thank you that you bring us through the trials and the, and the uh, water parks and everything that we that we face in our life and we're able to walk again after we fall and yeah we we kind of feel it for a few days lord but you bring us through that and you make us whole again and that's that's one of the wonderful blessings that we get from you so we thank you lord that we are here to worship this morning freely and openly in your name and we ask that you would open our ears to hear your message today for our hearts to receive that message and for us to live it out each and every day of our lives we praise you and thank you in all these things in your son Jesus name we pray Amen. Amen. so our call to worship that Pastor Terry has chosen this morning comes from 1 Peter 2 9 and this is from the New International Version translation but you are a chosen people a royal priesthood a holy nation God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And that is an awesome, awesome statement. That's a follow-up then to what Paul wrote in Ephesians, and I wanted to share that with you this morning. Um, in Ephesians 2 and 19, it says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ himself, as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, too, you are being built together to be a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So what Paul is telling us and what Peter is telling us in here is that we are joined together as the family of God. God accepted us then into his royal priesthood. And we hold the same place as what Jesus holds with God in heaven because we are part of that royal family. We are the church, the people of God. Through our discipleship, then we become a priesthood. As we discover God's word and he reveals his word unto us as we come together with him, we become then a royal priesthood. And that's what Peter is talking about here. God promised Moses that his covenant people of Israel would be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And we inherit that through, and this is what, what Paul was telling us in his letter to the Ephesians, we inherit that through the birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He 
he cemented that relationship for us then through that. And that promise is fulfilled in the New Testament by the church, which then becomes the Israel of the Old Testament. The disciples of Christ are a royal priesthood and then a holy nation. As we study his word and we come into relationship, we talked about relationship a lot last week, but as we come into that covenant relationship with God, a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship with God that we can only do through Jesus, then as we become that, then we become that royal priesthood that God, that they're talking about here in uh, 1 Peter. So, in the Old Testament, the priest of old then, they presented offerings and the sacrifices to God. They would be the intercessor between the people and God themselves. But then after Christ came and he made his sacrifice, then he opened that way so we don't have to have an intercessor. We have that covenant relationship with God through Christ. And so as they did in the old days, the priests then would deal with the sins of the people and they would atone for the sins by going into the Holy of Holies. And they, there was only certain people who could go into the Holy of Holies in the temple and then they would present the sacrifices as an atonement for the people's sins, as the people brought the sins to them. So they had a professional class of priests back in the day, and they were waiting for the day the whole nation would assume then those priestly duties, and these people were called Sadducees back in the day, the keepers of the temples and of the temple laws. So Christ then, when he came, he dealt with those sins once and for all, for all people, and he destroyed then the need for that special atonement ceremony that they had in the temple of old times. And they broke down that partition, then that barred God from the people. And that veil was torn in two at the temple. That signified that that opened that way for those people to have that covenant relationship with God. Each believer at that point in time then was responsible then, number one, to go to God and confess to receive that forgiveness of sin. Number two, to live a holy life representing the holy God before a sinful world. So as Christ's representatives to the world, we are to represent God in a holy and unsinful nature to a sinful world. Number three, we are to praise God in word and action and then offering spiritual sacrifices to God since animal sacrifices are no longer needed. Number four, then, we are to study God's word and to teach others, have a life of piety. So I'm sure you guys probably have heard that. Uh, someone who is very pious then studies God and is faithful to the word and his life. That through Christ, the church has become the Israel of God that they talked about in the Old Testament with the covenant with Moses. The chosen people then, and then we become each member as a body of Christ, as the church we become that fulfilling priestly role that they used to have the Sadducees for within the temple. Then in this priestly role, the individual, us, is to maintain proper ties to the larger body, the church. We are to be in communion with each other. So as believers, as the family, as the body of Christ, we can't separate ourselves. And that's what Paul was talking about when he was talking about the different parts of the body. You don't separate the foot, and the foot doesn't go its own way. It has to remain in the body in order to fulfill its purpose that God had intended when he created it. Same too with us as the church. We need to stay in communion with each other so that we can fulfill the purpose that God has for us, not only as individuals, but as the whole of the church together. We work within the church then to find God's will individually and as a body of Christ, as the church itself. We work within the church to carry out God's will in the world, and we work for and not against the church. This means we don't seek to force our will on the church, nor do we rebel when the church decides that this is not the path that we want to go down. We don't rebel against that, but we join with the church in order to, uh, as long as it's scripturally proper to do so, uh, we learn then to cooperate together, even in our differences, to bring forth the word of God and the presence of God to a sinful world. People who may not see God any other way or 
experience God any other way. So that is what we're called to do in our journey from darkness to light. And Pastor Terry's message this morning is on darkness to light. And what a great segue that was. Thank you. Um, so uh, let us join together in prayer as we open this time of worship. Gracious Lord, we just praise you and thank you for your word that comes to us in many different ways. Lord, through our, our message in the word, from our call to worships, from the, the songs that we hear, your message plays out to us in many, many different forms. So we just ask that you would open our hearts and our minds to accept something that may be brand new and may be foreign to us, but yet it's your word reaching out to us to call us into a deeper relationship. We ask a special blessing on Pastor Terry this morning as he gives us this message that you've laid upon his heart to share with us this morning, that we might be fed, that we might come into that covenant relationship with you. And we pray that you would use this then as we bring it into our hearts to live it out each and every day. Live your word, live your message out to a broken world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. just handed Denise a, a prayer request that came online so if you are watching online and you do have a request please uh, go ahead and give us a shout out and we'll make sure that that gets added to the prayers well good morning everyone good morning. It's, good morning. well this morning was pretty nice I don't know about this afternoon it's supposed to get pretty hot and muggy time for a water park trip again <laughs> The sun is out, it is beautiful out, but as I was preparing for the message this week and, and focusing on that journey from darkness to light, the very first thing that came to mind was what we will be having an anniversary of in just six short days. About 12.30 on August 10th, 2020, uh, we had gone home to work after the pandemic started and uh, I was sitting there I was talking to one of our our stores and all of a sudden it got I have two windows and they have those uh, accordion uh, shades so the light comes through not then it was pitch black outside and then I heard the wind pick up and I said you know I'm not sure what's going on. At that point in time, they hadn't hooked us to our computers to where we could had to stay where we were at. We were actually using our cell phones. So I walked upstairs and said, let's go for a walk while we wait on that to process. Let's go for a walk. We're going to see what's going on. And I looked out the window and it's pitch black out. And the winds are blowing in a way that I had never witnessed before. We had an ash, or excuse me, an elm. It's now gone, courtesy of the borer. But this branch went out over our neighbors. It went across, we have sidewalks in our backyard between the properties. It went out over that, over their fence and halfway into their backyard. But it was like this. It had literally bent 90 degrees and was no longer over the sidewalk. Um, and then I hung up with him. I was back down in the basement and the lights went out and then it was dark. I had no light. I used my cell phone flashlight to find my way to the steps so that I could get upstairs. For us, the lights were out for 12 days. Some others it was less, still others it was longer. But it was nothing like October 29, 2012. Y'all remember Superstorm Sandy that hit the eastern United States? New York City took a huge hit. So did New Jersey and several other coastal areas up and down. It even got as far west. You really think it's further west than what it is, but it got to Cleveland, Ohio and knocked them out. And it plunged. We were plunged into darkness, but we're not. I mean, this is not as large an area and for some that lasted for weeks. It was darkness that claimed a lot of lives. 
the derecho, there were across the Midwest, there were at least three deaths that I'm aware of. One, a lady was sitting on her front porch in Iowa. Another one was an electrician who was trying to work on a power line. And then the third was a, a woman in Indiana whose trailer rolled and took her life. But this storm took even more. And it, when we talk about darkness, this is something that can scare people. There are people that are literally scared of the dark. I, when I was a youth pastor, we did this hide and go seek in the dark in the church that I was at. And in that basement, it was dark. And, but I knew every inch of that facility. Except I'd forgotten about the big screen TV. Somebody had donated for our movie room. Cracked my head on that. But darkness is scary for some. It can affect like these storms did, affected not just individuals, they affected families, it affected entire communities. And for years to come, we, are, we still don't have the tree cover that we had. It took years to rebuild the things that Sandy destroyed. And electricity, we're, we're pretty used to, in this country, used to reliable electricity. You know, the, the air is on in here, the lights are on. But it wasn't during those times. And so we've all experienced that kind of darkness in some form or fashion. And it can be deep, it can be crippling, and it can be lasting. But there's also another darkness. There's a darkness that affects us mentally and spiritually, and, and because of those two, it can affect us physically. And if it's affecting you right now, well, that can all change today. Mark mentioned a little bit ago, and, and but we've been over the last several weeks going through the stories of the Bible and their messages. And these stories have occupied our attention on Sunday mornings and certainly during the Wednesday night group discussions as well as watching the episodes on Wednesday nights. And as we've watched those episodes, you've certainly noted the entertainment value. They were well done. But each episode has a gripping and memorable story in it. A few separate stories, but one centralized story. And we've been intentionally going through this as a way for God to show us how those same stories are our stories. Over the past four weeks, we've seen how the redemption that God offers to each and every one of us can lead us from death to life, slavery to freedom, victimhood to victory, and religion to relationship. And we continue on this and this is kind of the culmination of all of that. Those previous stories all lead up to this one. And this morning we're going to begin in the hours following Jesus' arrest, his trial, and his crucifixion. It's a series of events that took his friends and followers by surprise. They were not expecting that. They Remember, they were all expecting a warrior king to come in and free Israel. And when I mentioned that the derecho anniversary is only six days away, this all happens in a point where uh, less than a week before they were celebrating him coming into the holy city. They had laid their clothes out on the path. He was riding in on a donkey as a king would. He had cleansed the temple as a prophet. And then he was arrested. He was tried and convicted and ultimately executed as a criminal. And that's just hard for them. They had, they had seen that Jesus, the disciples had seen him walk on water. He'd gotten Peter out of the boat. He'd fed 
fed thousands upon thousands. And he'd even raised the dead. But then what happens next? Matthew 27, 45 says it this way, darkness fell across the whole land. I don't know about you, but I'm praying in the back of my mind right now for those first responders as they go to help whomever they need to take care of today. Makes me think about the darkness that could fall upon us in, in bad times when things are going just off the rails. So that darkness, it didn't just fall across the land, it fell across the people too. It fell across their hearts, their minds, and their spirits. Now the question I wrote next was, have you ever felt like that? And my brain says, of course they have. But it was made to make you think. And you might even be feeling that way today, or you might know someone who is going through that right now. If that's the case, we would want you to know, and we would want them to know through you, that there is hope. At the time of Jesus' crucifixion, Luke records it this way. This comes from 23, 44, and 45. By this time, it was about noon, and darkness fell across the whole land until 3 o'clock. The light from the sun was gone, and suddenly the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn down the middle. Luke's the only one that records that second part, that the curtain was torn. Now, I don't know about you, but if it all of a sudden gets dark, especially after the derecho, I start to wonder what's going on. I start to maybe, well, if I'm honest, worrying a little bit. It's kind of like when you hear the wind. The wind has not blown any harder in the last four years than it did in the past 20 years before it. But we're so attuned to it because of that experience. When it gets dark like that, Oftentimes, it's not anything good. And I told you just a moment ago that there is hope. So to get to that point and to understand that hope, we're going to explore John chapter 20 together. And for those of you that want to grab a book of the Bible, or the, uh, the Bible and look at it, the red Bible's in front of you, Those it's on page 808. So if you've got a different Bible, I don't know what chapter that is. If you're looking on the Bible app on your phone, you can just search for it very easily. But we're going to be looking at three aspects of the great salvation. And these are the three aspects that we have been exploring through the last several weeks. And we'll be doing this in the light of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. So the first aspect or facet of this salvation comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And here it is. I am saved from the darkness of confusion and enter into the light of a new commission. So John 20 verse 1 says this. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. We're going to hit pause. Try to understand Mary's mindset that morning. She would have been grief stricken. It was just two days earlier she had witnessed Christ's crucifixion. This was a man who she had put so much hope in. And in our humanness, what do we do when something like that happens? We, the grief part of that, she had expected so much more and so many different things. But she had also seen him suffer. And I don't know about you, I've seen a depiction of that. I saw a depiction of that. I can tell you the date, February 24th, 
2004. It was the day that I got to see the Passion of the Christ. And I saw the way they depicted that. It's still stuck in my mind 20 years later. So you can imagine seeing it in real life. How that's just sticking with her. Now, if you've ever lost someone close to you, someone important to you, you feel like time stops. I had the honor and privilege of serving a family this week who lost a loved one. And as you meet with them, that's the thing that just sits with me. Time for you or time for them stopped. And it's in that time that grief starts to kick in. It can linger, it can fester, it doesn't go away just overnight. And just because the service was on Friday doesn't mean that Saturday everything was all, as my age would say, hunky-dory. She was probably just like others in a mentally very dark place and because of her expectations of Christ she may have also likely been in a very spiritually dark place many of us can identify with that but I doubt if any of us are much worse off than Mary was that morning so we're going to jump ahead. We're going to jump ahead to verse 14. Where it begins and says, She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying, Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him and I will go get him. Mary, Jesus said. She turned to him and cried, Rabboni, which is Hebrew for teacher. You know, we like to teach you different words. Verse 17 goes on and says, Don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I haven't yet ascended to the Father, but go, find my brothers and tell them I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. Then she gave them his message. So she sees Jesus, but at first she doesn't recognize him. She thinks he's the gardener. Could have been her deep grief. We know she was likely crying or that she was crying. So you know how it is to try and see when you're crying. It, everything gets blurred. It could have been that where he was standing and she was standing, that she was squinting to see him because the sun was shining in her eyes. It may have been a foggy morning. Thinking he was the gardener, she might not have even been looking directly at him. In your grief, sometimes when someone is talking to you, you don't look right at them. You kind of give them that side glance because of where you are at with the way you're feeling. Then again, it could have been the radiance of his appearance playing tricks with her eyes. There's no way for us to know for sure. And it could have been a combination of all the above or parts of all the above. Or it could have been something else altogether. We don't know. But what we do know is that initial confusion that she had, that initial not knowing who he was, thinking he was the gardener, that all disappeared like morning fog when he said, Mary. Her grief was gone. The darkness that enveloped her was gone. And in its place, oh, I don't know about you, it makes me I get goosebumps. Pure excitement and joy that she would have felt. 
And in the midst of this, before she was likely even had a chance to get her bearings, what happened next? Well, Jesus gave her a mission. He commissioned her to take the good news of his resurrection to the others. She became the first evangelist of the Christian faith. Mary experienced instantaneous clarity, which is something that can happen for each of us as well. For anyone who is downhearted or confused or even depressed, they, they can find clarity by inviting Jesus into their hearts and lives. Now we've said this before and we'll say it again, doesn't make life easier. It doesn't make the problems go away. But the peace and comfort that we have in knowing Christ, knowing God is the Father, lifts us up above the circumstance. His resurrection tells us, among other things, that this life is not all there is. It tells you that death is not the end. It tells you that if you hope in Christ, all your hope can be and will be revived. It tells you that your Savior has triumphed over the worst that this world can throw at you. Scripture tells us, what's the worst man can do? Take your life. But just as Jesus was raised from the dead, we are raised to life with the Father in heaven. And like Mary, when we trust in Jesus, we get the same commission to spread the good news. This is one of the last things that Jesus said to the disciples. Go into all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that was Jesus' word to Mary and ultimately to each of us. Go. It could even be said that the darkness lifts not in hearing the good news, but in the going. I'm going to qualify that a little bit. Remember the ten lepers. Jesus heals them. But when were they healed? Was it that moment that they're in front of him? No. Jesus gives them a commission. He told them to go and show themselves to the priests. And Luke 17, 14 says, And as they went they were cleansed of their leprosy. As they obeyed his words, they were healed. As we obey his word, the darkness goes away and the light of his commission to give us a new purpose happens. And that's not all. Another facet of salvation that comes through faith in Jesus Christ is this. I am saved from the darkness of fear and enter into the light of a new presence and peace. So let's look at another part of this story, starting at verse 19. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. And as he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side, and they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. These verses tell us that the disciples were gathered behind locked doors. And as I think about that, I think of Christians who live in countries where it's not only frowned upon, it's illegal and can lead to death by being a Christian. They were locked behind those doors because why? They were afraid of the Jewish leaders. They were afraid of what the leaders... They saw what they did to Jesus. Are they going to do that to us? Fear is a powerful and very negative motivator. 
And after all they had seen and done, fear was still getting to them. Peter, the one who walked on water, was behind the locked doors for fear. James, one of the sons of thunder, was behind locked doors because of fear. John, who had stood by Jesus to the bitter end, was locked behind closed doors for fear. They were all cowered together in the darkness of fear. I know what that's like, and I'm sure you do as well. And whether you want to admit it, we've all cowered in that darkness of fear. You may not have been physically locked behind doors. It may have been mentally or emotionally. We're all cowering in fear of something. It may be that we're cowering in fear because we fear losing our job, fear losing a loved one, fear of being hurt again, fear of messing up again. Could be any number of things. But what happened next? Jesus came, stood amongst them, and said, Peace be with you. He came and said, Peace. He removed their fears with his presence and his peace. He gave them the Holy Spirit by whom his presence would continue with them even after he ascends into heaven. We can all have that as well. Salvation in Jesus Christ saves us from that darkness of fear and brings us into the light of his presence and peace. And we can have that same peace. We just have to invite him into our lives. And that is not all. There is still one more facet of salvation that comes through faith in Christ. And that is, I am saved from the darkness of doubt and enter into the light of a new beginning. So let's go back to John 20 and go to verse 24. One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands and put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were all together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, because he already knew what Thomas had said. He said, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. A week later, Thomas is with him. He wanted more than words. He wanted to understand. He wanted to see. He, he needed that evidence. He needed to see it. You know, because the saying is, seeing is believing. He needed physical proof. And then what happens? The risen Christ appears and removes all doubt. But I want you to notice something else about this passage. Thomas had vowed not to believe until he touched Jesus' hands and side. If you got your Bibles open, look at that again. Then you want to pop that back one slide. Put your hands or put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound of my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. Go ahead. My Lord and my God. Notice what's missing there? It does not say that Thomas actually touched him. In fact, it goes from Jesus talking to him to Thomas saying, my Lord and my God. 
Apparently, he didn't need to touch the wounds like he thought he did. He only needed to see Jesus for himself. And the same is true for all of us. We may think we need proof. We may think we need something that's tangible, something irrefutable, before we can believe. But we really don't. We need to see Jesus with the eyes of our heart. A fresh vision of Jesus will dispel the darkness of doubt and give us all a new beginning. It was true then and it is still true today. Now, soon after they were cowering in fear behind those locked doors, they would take to the streets of Jerusalem. It would be on those very streets that Peter would preach a sermon like none other. The first sermon of the church. And apart from Jesus's teachings and Jesus' sermons, it was most likely the most successful sermon in all of history. Peter and John would later go on and heal a blind beggar just outside the temple in Jerusalem, despite being warned by the chief priests. And then they would go out and boldly proclaim the good news. You would never know that these disciples were the same ones that were cowering in a room. The darkness of doubt had been replaced with the light of a new beginning. And I can hear the question already, how do we know that the message that Jesus commissioned them to take to the world is true? And that's when I think of this quote from Chuck Colson. Now, some of you might be too young to remember or even know what Watergate is, but after the message day, Google it. Google Chuck Colson and Watergate. But Chuck said this, I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. They, they proclaimed that truth for 40 years never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. The message never changed in those 40 years. Over the course of those 40 years, they were killed off, but they never changed it, even to death. Yet, those 12 politicians couldn't even keep it for three weeks. Are you ready to have the darkness removed from your life? You can be saved from darkness of confusion and enter into the light of a new commission. You can, have, you can be saved from the darkness of fear and enter into the light of a new presence and peace. And you can be saved from the darkness of doubt and enter into the light of a new beginning. It all happens when your eyes are open to the risen Christ, when your heart opens to him, when you do as Jesus urged stop, Thomas, stop doubting and believe. <coughs> Jesus' word to Thomas is his word to us, and that is believe. It is my prayer, and I know it's Mark's as well, that you would let Jesus guide you from darkness to light, from confusion, fear, and doubt to a new connection, a new presence of peace in your life, and a new beginning. As our message this morning comes to a close, I invite you to sincerely pray the prayer that's going to be on the screen with me. Lord Jesus, be risen in my heart today. Shine your light into my darkness. Dispel my confusion, fear, and doubt. 
overcome all my reluctance or procrastination. I confess that I am a sinner and need a Savior. I turn to you right now and I claim your sacrifice on the cross as a payment for all the wrong things I've done and your resurrection from the dead as the basis of my life from this moment on. I ask you to come into my heart and take charge of my life. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, let me tell you what the Bible says about you. And you're going to recognize this from just a short time ago. A little different version. Mark read from the NIV. This is from the NLT. And it says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Mark and I would love to meet with anyone who would like to talk more about God's good plans for your life. And you may be here in person, you may be watching online today or someday in the future. Please reach out. You can contact us through social media, through our email info at gracestreet.church. You can go to our website. There's a messaging tool there where you can just message us right there. We would love to talk to you about what God has in store for you. Lord God, thank you for the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Thank you for calling us out of darkness and into your wonderful light. Help us to live in the light day by day, moment by moment. By the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us from stealing back and behind locked doors. Deliver us from ever again letting ourselves be dragged down by confusion, by fear, and by doubt. Make us all, each and every one of us, a true bearer of your light, a herald of the resurrection. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. As we come into this time of communion this morning, I, I want you to think back of the darkness, about the, the words that Jesus spoke in the Garden of Gethsemane that fateful night before he was taken to be put on the cross. And it's words that echo through our minds as well. And he said, Lord, if it is your will, take this cup from me. But not my will, but yours be done. There had to be some trepidation there, some, some fear, because Jesus was fully human and yet fully God. And so in his heart, he was probably saying, hey, if this is your will, you know, let me know. But I'm going to be true and faithful to you. And out of the darkness of his heart, then God poured light into him and let him know that it was of his will and to fulfill his will. And see, it wasn't out of fear, it wasn't out of Roman uh, power or might or anything that Jesus actually went to the cross. It was out of love, an agape love, a love that has <clears throat> no strings attached. An agape love, that term that I, that I taught you guys a little while back. Uh, but that agape love, then, is a love that is never-ending. It is given unselfishly without any kind of strings attached. It is a kind of love that is unending at last eternity. See, it wasn't the nails, it wasn't the ropes that held him to the cross, it was that agape love. He didn't go to the cross out of fear. He didn't go to the cross out of fear, he went to the cross out of and so today I, I call you to remember that sacrifice that, that he made for us, each and every one of us, God's people. Through him we become that royal priesthood because of his love, that unending agape love. 
So on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said to the disciples, this is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat. Likewise, later in the meal, he took a cup and he filled it and he blessed the cup. And he said, this cup is a cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. Then he went on to say later on in the scriptures it tells us that we are to take of the bread and drink of the cup each and every time that we gather together in remembrance of that sacrifice, that agape love that he had for us. And so today as we share in that, let's partake of the body and the blood of Christ. The body of Christ broken for you. blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to see everybody here this morning. And I thank God I'm here today. <laughs> Terry was talking about fear. You want to find Jesus, just go on a roller coaster ride and when you break air and hit the tunnel, you'll find him. I'm screaming Jesus' name all the way through. <laughs> and he, he got me through and then Steve lifted me out <laughs> of the car. So praise God. <laughs> but it's time for prayers for the people today. So um, if anyone has a prayer that they would like to me to pray for, let me let me know. Um, okay. Yes. I need prayer for my foot. Oh, your foot's bad too. Yeah, oh, I don't no. know what's wrong with it. The doctor doesn't know what's wrong with it. Oh. The bones there, and oh, and it's real painful. Oh, okay. Okay, and your left foot. Yep. Okay. All right. Anybody else? All right. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we come into your presence to exalt you above all things. Psalms ninety-three, one and two. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and is armed with strength. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. We have come to praise you, God, for who you are. And thank you for loving this nation and your people. You do not give us what we deserve, but your love for us is as far as the east is from the west. You will not stay silent forever, but you will uphold us with your righteous right hand. Help us to be a people that acknowledges your name above all names, so that you might hear our prayers and come to our aid both day and night. For you are our mighty God and creator, Yahweh Elohim. And thank you, Lord, for listening to this prayer. Father God, I would like to ask that you stamp out all the fires all over this nation that are raging out of control. Please bring your mighty rain to drown out these fires and restore the beautiful earth to what it is. And Father God, I lift up Alan Tickey and his family who laid Bonnie Tickey to rest Friday. Please walk with them each and every day and comfort their hearts and minds as only you can. And we praise you, God, for Bonnie's life. Father God, I pray for all who are suffering with severe pain in their bodies, those who, are, who have cancer or severe illness or ailments of any kind. We pray for Deb for her foot, Father God. I pray that you will lift them out of this bondage. Let the blood of Jesus wash over them, cleanse them of all their pain and suffering, renew their bodies back to health, and let us praise you, Father, for all that you are doing and will be doing in their lives. Thank you, Jesus, for your love for all of us. And Father God, I pray for Monica and her son, Matt, and daughter, Mary. Their family is going through a lot right now, Father God, and I just pray that you uh, give them hope for each new day, Lord Jesus. Help them to, fo Father, to follow you in all things that they do. I pray that you will help Mary with her pain, Lord Jesus. Um, 
Help her to get to the doctors that she needs to help her find out what is wrong with her, Father God. Be with Monica and give her hope and um, comfort her through the stress that she is going through. And help Matt to deal with his problems with his family, Lord Jesus. But to do it with you, Father God. For we can't do anything on our own, Lord Jesus. And let, let you be with them throughout their whole life, Father God. And Father, I ask for um, safe travels for my grandson Riley on his trip back to San Antonio this week. Please give the pilot wisdom and knowledge to know how to fly the plane safely to his destination and help him to have a friend there that will um, take him home safely. Be with my grandson Dylan and his family as they travel to California. Protect them and guide them and bring them back safely as well, Father God. But Father God, we lift up our children and grandchildren to you. We ask that you give them wisdom, self-esteem, and confidence to always choose your way of life, and that you will guide them forever on the paths of righteousness. When they fall, Lord, pick them up, turn them around, and guide them always back to you. Help them to understand your word and to know that you work all things together for their good. You will never leave them or forsake them. May they be full of faith, and help them to hold on to your truth. Father God, please guide our homeless to live according to your will and not their own. And let us all be more than conquerors in Christ. Because in Romans 8:28 it states, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Help us to be a people that strive to do your will and to acknowledge you in all things. In Jesus' mighty and precious name, amen. amen. As we prepare to close out the online portion of our service, I leave you with these final greetings from Paul to the Thessalonians, and this is from 2 Thessalonians. It says, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times, and in every way the Lord be with you all. Whatever darkness you're going through, give it to God. Father God, we just thank you that no matter what's going on in and around our lives, whether we're dealing with something physically, something spiritually, emotionally, mentally, that whatever it is, we need to pause. We need to just stop and breathe and remember the peace that your Son gives us. Thank you, Father, for the many blessings of the day, for getting us up again today, for letting us come together. Take us out of this place, Father, and let us be our, your beacon of light in this ever-darkening world. In Jesus' name.